Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Radical Candor podcast. I'm Kim Scott, co-founder of Radical Candor and also Just Work. And I'm Jason Rosoff, CEO and co-founder of Radical Candor. And I'm Amy Sandler, your host for the Radical Candor podcast. Our next several episodes are going to be explorations of the nuts and bolts details about each step of the get shit done wheel. First up is listening. In the first episode of season three, we discussed the differences between quiet and loud listening. And we'll go ahead and put that link in the show notes. You can check it out if you're interested in learning what kind of listener you are and how you can best leverage that. Today, we're going to be talking about how to create a culture of listening, because if you can get your team members to listen to each other, they're going to fix things that you as the boss didn't even know were broken. There's three key steps to creating a culture of listening. First, create a simple system that employees can use to generate ideas and voice complaints. Second, make sure that at least some of the issues raised are quickly addressed. And then third, regularly offer explanations as to why the other issues aren't being addressed. Kim, you shared in the book about an ideas team that you had created at Google. And I I loved reading that because I am someone who has a lot of ideas. And I've also been at an organization where I shared lots of those ideas and then they were never acted upon. And the net result was after, you know, a couple of years of sharing ideas and not having them act upon, I felt really disengaged. And so it was really validating for me to read uh, that in your book. And in fact, a recent study from Salesforce shared that employees who feel their voice is heard are 4.6 times more likely to feel empowered and perform their best work. Let us know, Kim, how did you come up with the ideas team idea? And that's sort of very meta, the idea of the ideas team, and how, how in fact, did it work? So I think the, the problem that I was experiencing was that I was, I was managing a team of extremely engaged uh, individuals, many of them straight out of college, and they had great ideas, but they would bring their ideas to me and expect me to make them happen. <laughs> and I just, you know, there was there were 700 of them and only one of me. I couldn't possibly uh, make all these great ideas happen. And I realized one, it was late one night, someone came in all enthusiastic with a great idea. And my instinct was just to tell them to, to just tell them to put it in a can. You know, I, I had this very negative feeling like, I am exhausted. Why do you keep bringing me all these bright ideas? And then I felt like this kind of grouchy old woman that I didn't want to be. But at the same time, like I cared about my team's work-life balance, but I also cared about my own. And, and so, and I was exhausted. And I realized that what I needed to do was, was just Be open with the team. Like, you all have great ideas. I can't possibly make all your great ideas happen all by myself. I'm just one person. And so I said, it's not that I don't want to hear your ideas. And and I realize sometimes it may seem to you when you come to me with great ideas that I don't want to hear them. Because what I'm thinking is all the 30 things I have to do to make these ideas happen. And I don't have time to do those 30 things. So I said, what we're going to do is we're going to create, but but we want to surface ideas. I, I have this strong belief that there, in fact, we can drop a link to an article in, in the show notes, but I read, I had read an article about the fact that sustainable competitive advantage doesn't actually come from these gigantic Schumpterian step change function ideas, but a lot of little ideas, a lot of little ideas. Uh, and, yeah. I don't even want to call them little, but a, a lot of incremental ideas can, can actually have a bigger impact. It's a different way to look at innovation. And so I said, these ideas that you all have are really important, and we need to come up with a way of figuring out as a team wh- what we're going to do and which ones we're going we're gonna to implement because we can't do it all. There were several people on the team who were who were most passionate about changing things, and so they volunteered to lead the ideas team. And I said, everyone, when you have an idea, when something's annoying you at work, write it down. Write the idea for a fix or just, just write the problem down. It's okay to complain about problems. That's how we fix them. 
we can upvote ideas and the ideas team, but it's not going to be sh- sh- only by, you know, a democratic process. The ideas team is going to apply some, some judgment to the ideas, which ones will have the biggest impact, uh, which ones are pretty easy to put into practice. Uh, and I said, the ideas team can assign me three tasks per week, not 300, but three things <laughs> that they want me to do every week. So it's not that unwilling to help. But I, I can't carry the whole burden of, some, of the great ideas of 700 people. You know, there were some ideas. I think I've told the story about the programmable keypads before. There were some great ideas that came out of that. And I think the key thing to making the ideas team work was, one, to make sure that I was helping every week, but, two, to make sure that we were sort of measuring the impact uh, of those ideas, the collective impact of those ideas. So that's the the TLDR version of the big ideas team. And for people who don't know what TLDR is, too long, don't. I was going to say TL, TLDL. Don't, TL, yeah. TL, don't listen. Yeah, I rambled. <laughs> anyway, that's the rambly version. Okay, of- too long, don't listen. Speaking of listening, uh, hopefully folks are still listening. I, I found that actually really interesting. And Jason, I'm curious as you hear Kim's story, this was a team of 700 people. What's, what's been your experience with, with smaller teams about ideas teams? Uh, have you seen different versions of what Kim is describing? I think one of the biggest challenges with the ideas team idea for a lot of teams is that, well, it's a lot of teams and a lot of ideas. Ideas team <laughs> idea for many teams is that there's not spare time especially small organizations like ours, we're like redlining 100% of the time, right? There's not there's not like a spare minute. So the idea of creating a team to do something is sort of hard to think about. And what I would say is you can take small steps in that direction too without having someone sort of become responsible for this thing. One discipline that we that I've had as a small team is we've always had a where we're gen, especially where we're creating stuff and generating lots of ideas all the time is we have a, a parking lot, like a a manifestation of like the idea of a parking lot. So we say, here are the ideas that we have. And when someone has a great idea in a meeting in some other context, we're like, great. What I've used in the past is Trello for this. I'm biased. I know, but, um, it's it's actually great for organizing. You want to explain uh, why you're biased? Uh, (laughs) I'm, I'm biased because because I was there at the start. Of, of trail. It yes. was there at the take, start. I don't take the I don't take the credit, but but yes. And then we would have some operating mechanism, monthly, quarterly, whatever it was, where we go through those those ideas and we'd say, like, let's pick one off uh, of the list to go after this month. So we're going to use some. We're going to set aside some time to go after one of these ideas that's been on the in the parking lot for a while. And we would do that in a kind of fun way. So like there would be, we would go in, we would sort of put all the ideas up either if it was on trail or we make physical manifestations of them. So we put them on post-it notes when we were together, we put them up on a whiteboard somewhere. Uh, and then everybody would get a couple of votes and you get to say, here are my ideas. You could make a pitch for why you think this particular idea is the best. And at the end of it, we'd pick one or two and we'd actually start to run with it. So I think you can implement it. I think it's probably more of a process than a team. If you're a small, if you're a small team. I think also the mindset is really important. Uh, One of the things that can happen on a small team is one person will have a great idea and expect someone else to implement that idea. And that's frustrating for everyone. So I think being aware on a small team that everyone is busy and just because it's a great idea doesn't mean other people have time to implement that idea. Yep. Yeah, that's a great point. That is a great, I feel like we had a recent example of that where I think I had a great idea and then Jason might've said, well, for a small team, uh, it's a great idea, but not sure how realistic that is. You know, just to go back to this idea of submitting ideas and really appreciate the distinction, what, you know, the size of team may influence it mindset as Kim is talking about. So people can submit ideas, but there's other tools in organizations like surveys. And so I'm curious, Jason, you know, in Radical Candor, we talk so often about how Radical Candor is measured not at the speaker's mouth, but at the listener's ear, that it's really these one-on-one conversations. So are survey and other, quote, listening tools really listening from, from your perspective? 
I think they serve an important function, which is often it is the case that regardless of how strong of a culture of listening you create, there are some people who may not feel comfortable speaking up. And so having more than one way for people to share their experience or their ideas makes sense to me. Most of the time, the way that surveys are used is to try to sort of take the temperature, like to get a a sense of like how people feel collectively. And the way that I tend to think about that is like, it's sort of like the guidance of if you're in a house and you think there's a fire and you touch the doorknob and the doorknob is hot, like don't go into that room. That's about as like detailed as a survey will ever get. Right. Like it, it it tells like something's going on in there, but it doesn't tell you what it is. And so ultimately I think whether it's ideas or sentiment that you're trying to track, like you need to have real synchronous conversations about these things to actually understand what's in somebody else's head, because even though it might be very clear to them It might not be very clear to the other people who are receiving the survey version text message of their uh, other idea. So it might be great and it might be totally actionable, but you might not know because asynchronous mediums are kind of tough for helping people understand and certainly improve their ideas. Yeah, I, I wanna. I'm gonna reiterate what you said, but maybe say it a little more crisply. A survey is not listening. Uh, I'm going to, a survey might point you in a direction where you need to go and listen. It's uh, as, as Jason said, it's like a fire alarm, but listening is like being a firefighter. You actually have to go in and listen. And it's, it's really, it's remarkable to me how often leaders mistake. And I love surveys. I was on the board of Qualtrics, right? Like surveys are really useful tools, but they are not listening. Listening is is something that that one person does with another person or a team. It's synchronous. So we have our definition from Kim Scott. Listening is synchronous. It's one-on-one. It can be in a team. And let's go into that a little bit further. Harvard Business School professor Amy Edmondson wrote a recent post where she reflects how organizations are in serious trouble when And this is a quote, most discussions on crucial issues are taking place inside conversations rather than in formal meetings where concerns can be addressed thoughtfully with people in a position to instigate a change, of course. And Edmondson goes on to describe how this happens because people believe it's not acceptable to tell the truth publicly. Kim, I know this is a really important topic for you, and I'm curious, how can meetings be a conduit instead of this type of barrier to listening and generating ideas? So I think one of the important things to remember is that while criticism needs to be offered in private, disagreement and debate have to happen in public. Creating uh, an organization where that kind of public debate and disagreement about an idea is is not felt to be criticism of an individual, I think is really, really important. And there are a few things that will help with that. One is making sure that you are helping people to build stamina for their new ideas in your one-on-one meetings. That is where you want to make sure that you're nurturing new ideas. You're listening to new ideas. And we'll talk later about helping people clarify them. But you want to make sure that you're giving an opportunity for people to, in private, play with new ideas. Johnny Ive from Apple said that that one of the things he really admired about Steve Jobs' management style was that he understood that new ideas are so easily crushed. They need to be nurtured. And I think (laughs) nurturing is not something that most people associate with Steve Jobs' management style. But he actually was very good at listening to new ideas, at bantering with key people new ideas, and, and not crushing them too early. So I think some of this needs to happen in private. You need to make sure that you're remembering to use your one on one meetings for that purpose. And at the same time, when you are having a public debate, again, we're going to go deep on debate in a couple of episodes, you want to make sure that you're creating an environment in which people don't associate their egos with their recommendations. 
that they're coming together and they understand that the goal is to everybody get on the same side of the table and get to the best answer together. I think one of the most important things you can do as a leader is to celebrate it when you're wrong and to make it fun to be wrong. (laughs) You know, that's why I used to have this, I was wrong, you were right statue that I'd go put on people's desks when I, when I worked at Google, that was really helpful for creating an environment in which it was okay to disagree with people. In fact, it was safe and fun to disagree with people, especially the leader. And it needs to come from the top. The leader needs to be wrong as often and as publicly as possible. Yeah, I'm wondering, Jason, as you hear Kim reflect on that, if we explore meetings and what you see as a leader, are there any examples that come to mind of where you feel like you either did or observed someone doing a good example of cultivating this kind of debate through listening, whether it's loud listening or quiet listening, an example of a meeting where you encourage this culture of listening? Yeah. So uh, when I was leading a team of designers and product managers at Khan Academy, we would have meetings like this all the time. And one of the hardest parts of this is like, even though we were a very flat for all intents and purposes, small and flat organization for all intents and purposes, there were some great examples of people automatically deferring to people who are like more senior than them. So like they would share an idea as someone more senior than them would disagree or say something different. And then all of a sudden that person would be like, oh, no, you're right. Yeah. So that's actually not that, you know, not that good of an idea. I feel like I started to notice that there was a direct correlation between the amount of time that I was speaking in those meetings and the amount of new ideas that we would get. And it was inversely proportional. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I was like, okay, like you need to shut up during these conversations because it's having this chilling effect right now. People don't trust the way that you're approaching this enough to like be willing to publicly disagree with you. And so but there are a couple of tactics that, that we tried in order to help with this. And one of them was, is a technique we've talked about before, which is like switching, like someone who is deeply disagreeing with something or how, or has a strong opinion to the contrary, actually like them taking on like, what, how would you argue for it? If you were in this other person's position, like how would you actually uh, argue for this idea? And what that forced people to do is to actually stop and make sure they're really hearing the other person to begin with. Right. Cause if you're going to take the, if you're going to say, here's why I support this, you actually have to understand the other person's argument, point of view or belief, like why they think it's a good idea. And that was quite effective. And it was especially important for leaders to to take on those other positions to show that they were really hearing what people were saying. And it often led to, it didn't always change people's opinion. I think this is one of the most important parts about this is like the goal is not necessarily to have people end up in a different place after going through an exercise like that. But it did force people to deepen their understanding of those ideas. And that made sure that people, one, felt heard. And number two, we often found that there was some nugget of greatness inside an idea that was impractical, right? So we would take a thing which is like, oh, we're going to customize something for every student and we're going to use AI to do it, right? Like it's, that would be the idea we'd start with. And then at the end of that conversation, we get to a place where it's like, oh, we're going to customize things for student. We're going to use this heuristic that's really easy to calculate ac- actually and does a pretty good job most of the time. And so all of a sudden we would have, we'd be taking a step in the direction of this great idea. It wouldn't be the per- quote unquote perfect implementation, but there's something great about it. And almost universally, students and teachers, whoever you're building the stuff for, would, would like these less than perfect versions. Like our less than perfect version was great for a lot of our users a lot of the time. Yeah, I think the notion, and we can drop this into the show notes, the notion of a Rogerian argument is really important here. And and a Rogerian argument is one in which you listen to the other person well enough that you can then switch sides and argue for the other person's position. That's the success. Uh, and that's that can really help people get on the same on the same side of the table. And I think if you're if you're a leader, it is it's really important to make sure that either you take Jason's advice and just zip it and shut your mouth and listen, or if you can't do that, which I often cannot, that you not just invite, but insist that other people disagree with you. And in fact, there was one leader I worked with who got this big gavel and he he had written on it, duty to dissent. 
And whenever he said anything, if nobody disagreed with him, he'd pass the gavel to them to, to make sure that they, were, that they were disagreeing with him. We're going to be, uh, are we going to need to add to our radical candor shop some, some gavels that say yes, uh, duty absolutely. to dissent with duty the quadrants on them? That's, that's yeah. fantastic. So, you know, we're, we've been talking about meetings and the role of the leader. Um, zip it or gavels is some of the takeaways I'm hearing. But I want to go back to this idea of one-on-one -on -one meetings, which Kim was also talking about. And Jason, how can people ensure that when ideas and problems that are brought to them directly, either if in your role as a manager, it's a direct report coming to you, or peer-to-peer, -peer, that they are addressed quickly and people feel recognized and comfortable continuing to submit ideas. And again, not just upwards, but sideways to all, all of the different direction. So one-on-one -on -one, uh, follow-up in terms of welcoming and responding to new ideas. First and foremost, there's a temptation as a manager to like jump to trying to solve a thing that you're hearing about for, for the first time. And this is a very dangerous temptation. Sometimes people are telling you because they want help, but sometimes they're telling you because they want a thought partner to actually figure out how to address the issue them, themselves. And so this is why it's very important to reflect what you are hearing. And as you start to come up with ideas about what you would do about this thing, to be really clear, to verbalize the, those ideas. And so this technique of like repeating back what I like, hey, I think I'm hearing you say, and based on what I'm hearing you say, this is what I'm, I'm thinking I would do, or here's how I'm reacting to this and offer them the opportunity to, cor to, to correct you. So that's thing number one is like, make sure you're hearing what you think you are hearing. And thing number two is, I think it is important to try to address issues quickly, but I would say more important than that is that you communicate clearly about what issues are going to be addressed in what time frame and how. So like there's a consistent drumbeat to your conversation that says, hey, when you bring an issue to me, I take it very seriously. Let me tell you how and when I can, ad I can, I can address this. Because sometimes, as, you, as in the example that you shared earlier, it might be like, I'm not sure when we can get back to this. I'm not saying this is, we're not going to do this, but I'm saying it's going in the parking lot for now because I'm not sure how or when we, we would be able to address it. And that also gives the person an opportunity to object because they could say that, that might be how you feel, but this is, you know, I, I feel like this is more critical and that's something we need to address. The temptation to act, I think, is often very strong. And what I have found is that when you say yes to a lot of these things in one-on-one -on -one conversations, each conver each agreement that you're making seems entirely reasonable. And then you get through a week and you look at the list of stuff that you've agreed to in your one-on-ones and it's a completely unmanageable list of things. There's absolutely no way you will, you'll ever accomplish them. And so much more important to me is like being consistent in the way that you communicate how and when you're going to get stuff done. Yeah. And it's interesting in terms of what you were saying about just what I heard you talking about of acknowledging the new idea and we're not going to do it right now, but I hear you. And then the other person can challenge in many ways. It's the reward, the candor part of when you are soliciting feedback. So it's rewarding the fact that someone came to you with an idea. It doesn't mean we're going to act upon it in this instance, but actually acknowledging it because absent that acknowledgement, you might not get some of the ideas. I don't know, Kim, was that some of what you were thinking about of just the importance of acknowledging it, even if you can't? act upon it? Yeah, absolutely. Say so, uh, th that's, I think, why Jason's Trello or Trello board or my proactive forbearance list can be so helpful is this is a great idea. And, and, and just reminding people that just because we're not going to do it doesn't mean it's not a great idea. There was one, mm -hmm. there was one designer at who I worked with at Apple who would, when he hired someone new, he would show them two notebooks. One had like 10,000 pages in it and the other had three. And he said, the notebook with the three pages, these are the ideas that we've actually implemented at Apple. And this 10,000 <laughs> page notebook. These are the ideas we've rejected. And this guy had really a, a, a reputation as being one of the best designers at Apple. He said, this doesn't mean that I've had all these ideas that we haven't implemented. Doesn't mean that I'm bad. Uh, I'm a bad designer. And it doesn't mean that these are bad ideas. It just means that, that what we want to do is focus here. And I thought that was a great way to teach people not to get, to remind people not to get discouraged 
when their great ideas weren't implemented because we all have a lot of great ideas and we don't have time to implement all of them. By the way, I want to thank a bunch of listeners suggested using the word implement instead of execute. So if you notice me hiccuping before I say implement, it's because it's my instinct to say execute, but I'm working on my language there. Yeah, thank you for that. And I love that example of the 10,000 sort of the 10,000 road not taken, the 10,000 ideas. To me, it it's another thing that you share a lot about, which is to make the listening tangible, right? Yeah. And and so you're you're literally showing here's all these great ideas. We wouldn't have gotten to those three perhaps without the 10,000 and really acknowledging that. The other thing I want to acknowledge, Jason, is what you were saying about really listening to understand, not going right to solution. It's why we practice focus listening in our workshops. In fact, in a workshop this morning, I was reflecting back what I heard a participant say, what I heard you say was this, is that right? And they were able to clarify, no, actually what I meant by that was this because it was coming from a chat. And so it gave them a chance to reflect further. It felt for more engagement and I was able to understand better. So active listening, this idea that first of all, your voice matters, but also getting more clarification is so important. And we're going to put a guide in the show notes around active listening as well. Kim, we've talked about meetings. We've talked about one-on-one meetings. You feel really strongly about how important listening in your one-on-ones is. Can you share more about why that matters so much? Yeah, absolutely. I so at one at one point when I was leading a big team, one of again, this is in this period of time when I was exhausted by all these bright ideas that were coming my way. And when people would bring to me, they not only did they bring great ideas, they brought problems. There were a lot of problems, as there always are. And I sort of made the mistake that, that Jason just talked about where I thought I had to solve all the ideas. And, and I, get, I mean, all, I had to solve all the problems and I was getting exhausted. And so to manage it, I said, when you identify a problem, I want to hear about it, but I want you to bring to me sort of three possible solutions in one recommendation. And when someone would come to me with a problem, I'd say, what, where's your recommendation? What are the other solutions? And finally, someone came to me and said, Kim, when do we get to come and just talk to you? <laughs> when, <laughs> when, when, and I, I realized that I had become too formulaic, uh, which is easy to happen when you're a manager. And so I, I shared, you know, this is an example of I was wrong. So I shared this with my team and, and I said, I'm totally fine just hearing about problems in a one-on-one. Like you don't have, when you come to meet with me one-on-one, you don't have to come with these, you know, ready-made uh, ideas for solutions to the problem in one recommendation. Just come, let's talk about the problem. Because I realized that the one-on-one time, the goal of the one-on-one time was really to s- sort of give people the freedom to, you know, use my services as a thought partner. I was not an answer giver. I was a thought partner. And that was important in my regular one-on-one meetings with my direct reports, but it was also important in one-on-one conversations that I had with a broader team uh, when I would sort of wander around, walk around and just talk to people or schedule that, that, you know, that, that was not always possible because it was a global team and I was in a different country than a lot of these people, just as it's not possible now because a lot of people are still working in hybrid or remote work environments. And so one of the things I did was I scheduled these 15 minute one-on-one meetings with, when the team was smaller, when the team was a hundred people, it didn't scale after that. But I would, I would have a 15-minute one-on-one meeting with everyone on the team once a quarter. And I learned so much in those meetings. I said, look, this is your time to tell me what's on your mind. Anything is fair game from furniture to strategy. Like, what's, what's screwed up? Tell me about what's screwed up. I can't promise I'll solve all the problems, but I do want to know about them. And maybe I'll have an advice for you about how you can help solve the problem. So that was that was really great. And th- the other thing that, that was so great wait, about Kim, just to be clear, this was you had a hundred people on the team, and you had fifteen minutes with each of them. Am I hearing that right? Yes, I did that. Uh, up, it doesn't scale past a hundred people, but okay. it was really fun. In fact, yeah. I, bumped, I bumped into somebody recently on Twitter who had been on the team who said, "You know, really, the one-on-one meeting that you had 
with me when I was right out of college. It made a big difference in my career. And it was, you know, it was, it was fun, fun to hear that. Uh, and, and of course, I hate to admit this, but of course, I don't even remember that one-on-one because I had so many of them. But listening matters, even if it can't persist. Yeah. I love that story. And I'm really curious, actually, just tactically, how did you know what the hundred ideas that you were getting from these 15-minute uh, meetings? I did not note them. I would say my, you know, my job is to listen and to give you some thoughts on what you can do to begin to solve the problem. And if, you know, there were a few burning things where, where I would take action, then I would make sure that I said, ah, in my 15 minute one-on-one with so-and-so, I learned about this problem and, and I realized I need to do something. But the, the less often I did something and the more often I helped people learn how to, uh, how, who to go to or, or how to solve the problem themselves, the better. Because I just, I'm one person. I couldn't, yeah. I, cu- I couldn't address the, you know, if I had tried to fix every problem that was brought to my attention in those 15 minute one-on-one meetings, I would have quit having them because I couldn't. I really love that. And I will say, you know, we do in our focus listening exercise, just two and a half minutes it is our tendency, as Jason said, to want to solve problems. But if we are listening in that two and a half minutes, the person can actually start to solve the problem for themselves or think about their own next steps. So I, I love that example. As you were saying that, Kim, there's one thing that was coming to mind, which is this step is of listening is so important from an editorial perspective, because I think there's a temptation to look at the, the get shit done wheel or, or to hear a problem and to either commit to doing it yourself or think I must marshal the forces of my team to respond to this issue that has just come up. That is the opposite of what the, the 10,000 page notebook and the three page notebook, te- yes. the story that, that tells you. It's like you can't, you can't, it's very tempting, I think, to say, well, you know, let's run this whole process for every single idea that comes up when in fact, what should be happening is as you're listening, you say, well, some of these things don't, we don't have to decide as a team, like this is something you can do. Like we, you and I can solve this or you can solve this on your own. Those types of things, I think that is in my mind that the real efficiency value of the listening step, because I think it's tempting to look at this time that you might spend in one-on-ones or the time that you spend listening in a group setting and say, you know, how much did we really get out of that? But in, when it works, what you get out of it is it's a really effective tool for helping you figure out like what is actually most important? What ideas are most resonant for people? Even before you go into clarify and debate, it helps you start to think about, you know, if going back to the the metaphor, you go from being the fire alarm to the fire, the, to the fire fighter, right? The, you actually start to see the, the things that need to be worked on much more clearly. Ho- hopefully that helps people feel excited about the possibility of listening and see the, the potential like accelerant that it is to hear these ideas um, and to not solve most of them, to say, we're not, we're not going to actually, that I hear it, we're not going to address it, or I hear it, and you can address it directly um, before you think about marshalling the full weight of the team to yeah. ideate and implement. That's such an important point. I'll never forget one time, the point, just to, just to put a pin in it, is that sometimes when you're listening, what you can do is you can tell the person, you can give the person some perspective that will help them realize that the problem that they're that they're raising may feel like the end of the world to them, but it's something <laughs> the organization can actually live with. One time when I was Google, an engineer made a mistake in the AdSense payment system and inverted exchange rates, <laughs> which meant that we were paying people <laughs> radically the wrong amounts. And I, this felt to me like the end of the world. And I remember going to Susan Wojcicki and saying, you know, "Ah," I was like (laughs) in a state, I I didn't have anything. (laughs) Just if you're not watching the video, there was some real (laughs) gesticulating and almost like a shock look on your face there. Yeah. (laughs) Well, it was shocking. And, and I remember Susan started to laugh and she told me about a much bigger mistake that had been made earlier. And she said, we're going to fix it. Just, you know, it's, it's going to, but it's, we're going to make mistakes again and it's okay. Like that's part of innovating and, and moving fast. And it, it, I remember feeling really calm all of a sudden. What had seemed to me this, this crisis, I realized it was, it was okay. I didn't, you know, I didn't have to 
to solve it instantly. It was going to get solved. So it was a comforting moment for me. I think another thing that I've been thinking about in terms of one-on-ones and listening in one-on-ones are sometimes you have the opportunity in your one-on-one meeting to sort of take a big step back and ask a person like, you know, what do you want to, what do you want to do with your life? Like, we're, we're like, we're in the throes of things and we're trying to do this, this, and this, but we're, you know, where do you want to be in five, 10, 15, 20 years? And it can be not, this is not part of a formal sort of career conversation, but just a convers, just a chat, a conversation. And that may not seem like such a big deal, but in his book, Whistling Vivaldi, Claude Steele talked about an intervention that was done. It was, in this case, it was for kids, but I think it also works in the workplace where kids were asked. So one group of kids was asked, you know, what are your values and where do you want to be in, you know, 20 years? And another group of kids was asked to write down, I don't know, what they had for dinner that night. And the the outcomes for the kids who had that one, you know, it was they were it was a writing exercise, but it was a version of a listening exercise. An adult was going to read this. It it was remarkable. So these these moments of listening can really uh, they may not feel like such a big deal to you, but they they can have a big impact on someone's work, but also on the trajectory of their career. Yeah, and I think the story you shared about the 15 minutes you spent with a recent college graduate, that had a real impact. So I think listening can help for so many different ways. Um, I just want to thank you. Kim mentioned this, but we did ask you for feedback on what to rename Execute in the Get Shit Done Wheel. We did our best to listen to you and are so grateful for your suggestions and the majority, and I think we agree with the majority, and that is Implement. So we will be, dare I say, implementing this in the coming months. And uh, (laughs) thank you, everyone, for playing and also for some grace if we continue to uh, use the the older word that we're we're letting go. The E-word. The E-word, yes. All right. So now it's time for our Radical Candor checklist. These are tips you can use to start putting Radical Candor into practice. Tip number one, your one-on-one meetings should be really reserved for listening to people, for for understanding what ideas do people have that they're not, that they don't have time to work on, what are the problems that people are wrestling with. You need to make sure that people know that they, this is your time to listen to them. And if it's helpful for them to come to you with an agenda, great. But if it's not helpful, like I can never remember to type of agenda notes. And if you think about like a meeting with a friend, you would never have to send before you had that conversation with a friend, a list of topics you wanted to discuss. You sit down and you talk and you listen. And, and I think that is the right mindset to go into a one-on-one meeting with, with someone. So there are some people whose bosses really want them to put in an agenda. And if that's what your boss wants, like, by all means, do it. I'm not telling you not to. But if you're the boss, I'm recommending that you that you treat your one-on-one meeting as an opportunity to listen and have a real conversation with folks. Tip number two, create a culture of listening to understand. The best thing that you can do here is encourage people when they are listening to others to at a minimum to repeat and reframe what it is that they're hearing. So saying something like what I hear you saying is, am I getting that right? Am I hearing you correctly? This is an essential step and actually ensuring that you understand one another. It gives people the opportunity to disagree when you say, this is what I think I'm hearing, which is incredibly important for making sure that you actually get to the second part, the understanding part of listening. And this is a practice that does scale. So even in a meeting, if you see people getting into a disagreement and you feel like they're sort of ships passing in the night, you can just encourage them to reflect what they're hearing. Tip number three, surveys are not listening, but you can adopt a simple system that allows people to easily generate ideas and and bring up problems like a Slack channel, a weekly ideas meeting, or other tools that may work best for your team. I think the most important thing here is to bring people along, keep them informed, whether their ideas will be implemented. And I know I will keep in mind that list of 10,000 ideas that got us to the three ideas that we implemented. So if we're not able to 
implement an idea, at least to acknowledge that the idea is there so that people continue to create this culture of sharing ideas and perspectives. So I'm going to summarize our three tips. One-on-one meetings, culture of listening to understand, Rogerian arguments is my favorite example, and three, create some form of ideas team. Surveys are not listening. For more tips, you can go to RadicalCandor.com backslash resources. Go ahead, download our learning guides for practicing Radical Candor. We'll have a bunch of show notes for you. Go to RadicalCandor.com backslash podcast. Go ahead, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. Don't forget, I always like to hear Kim share the title of her latest book. It is Just Work, How to Root Out Bias, Prejudice, and Bullying, to create a kick-ass culture of inclusivity. And again, the Radical Candor Store is now open. We now seem to have a new idea from this episode around gavels and and, uh, giving permission to dissent. In the meantime, go to RadicalCandor.com, click the shop link, and just want to say thank you for being our listener. We will continue to go through the get shit done wheel, but it starts with us sharing and you listening, and we look forward to hearing from you as well. You can always reach out to us at podcast at radicalcandor.com. Bye for now. Thanks for joining us. Our podcast features Radical Candor co-founders Kim Scott and Jason Rosoff, is produced by our director of content, Brandy Neal, and hosted by me, Amy Sandler. Music is by Cliff Goldmacher. Go ahead and follow us on Twitter at Candor and find us online at radicalcandor.com. 